I'm Paul Norman. I'm an OpenStreetMap developer, and uh, I'm working on the default style sheet on osm.org. And I, with various jobs, I've also been involved in vector tiles at a number of companies. There's, a, there's still a lot of confusion about what vector tiles are, what they're good for, and as of yet, there's no standardization of software like there has been in raster tiles. Um, so this talk is going over some of the various options uh, which there are. So first of all, what are tiles in general? When you have a map, you typically cut it up into tiles. They're, uh, it's cut up in a defined way, um, and the pr it, it's important that it's predefined for caching. That's the real important part about tiles. Now, the, in OpenStreetMap, we commonly uh, use the XYZ scheme for tiles, which is the same as Google's, and you see it in URLs like this. And uh, your zoom X and Y define what area of the world a particular tile is. So there's a few different ways to use raster tiles. They're all fairly obvious. Basically, you have these images, you stick them together, and you display them to the user. This could be in a browser with open layers, leaflet. You've got other ways to, if you're on a phone, if you're in an application. They all basically do exactly the same thing. They download the images, put them together in the right place, and allow you to zoom in and out and pan around and generally have additional features on top of that, like displaying points, displaying the reason you have a map. So points, uh, other features as, an over, as some kind of overlay. So how do we use vector tiles? That's not really the right question. What do we do with vector tiles is where you want to start. You can do analysis. Um, this, vector tiles are good for some types of analysis, very parallel, but uh, many spatial analysis you can't do within the context of a single vector tile. You would have to look at adjacent ones, so they're good for some types of analysis, but not others. You can con take vector tiles and you can turn them to raster tiles. This has some advantages uh, for maps uh, where you have where you're making a bunch of maps that are similar styles or just changing colors or scaling them up for high resolution devices. So even though you end up with vector raster tiles in the end, this different approach has some advantages. And a third common task is you send your vector tiles as vector tiles to a client device, which browser, mobile device, and they turn them client side into a rendering, which these days involves sending it to the graphics card, but something that ultimately gets you to pixels on your screen. Now, with each of these tasks, no one set of vector tiles is ideal for all the tasks. There's compromises involved in designing what's called a schema. The schema is um, the layer names, the attributes, all of that stuff that the cartographer designing the tiles has decided to include. There's uh, no one schema for everything. So some open examples of schemas are open map tiles, um, maps and tiles n. There are two schemas, they're both ultimately designed to render a map, but they've decided different things are priorities. They have different classifications of roads appearing at different zooms, and they're not interchangeable. There's other uh, close options like map, um, map box streets, which is different yet again. Um, Thunder Forest has their own set of tiles, and they're all designed differently for different purposes. You also get None of these are for analysis. There are other schemas for tiles where you're planning to do analysis. These are all designed for the same broad goal of displaying a map. 
So the overall strengths of vector tiles are uh, they're quick for rendering multiple similar maps. That's, in fact, why uh, Mapbox developed their, started with their vector tile stuff. It's also, as a consequence of that, is quick for rendering maps for print, which is a problem with some traditional map rendering options. And um, they're good for client-side rendering, which is why they were developed at, say, MapQuest, which is one of the first companies which used vector tiles. Their weaknesses. The big one is they're more complicated, much more complicated. This talk would be a quarter of the length if it was for raster tiles because there are obvious choices for everything. Because you've got the schemas, you've also got a higher risk for vendor lock-in. If you've developed your style to work with a particular set of vector tiles, you're tied in with that, particularly if it's not an open set that you could reproduce yourself. So you're locked, you're locked into that particular vendor unless you want to do a bunch of work to port your style to something else. There are no mature standardized tools. This, I see this in the questions I'm asked regularly. Uh, that's why I'm giving this talk. Another weakness related to this is there are very few people doing this independently. There are lots of people. There's local OSM local chapters. There's all sorts of people who are rendering raster tiles for their maps. And you can follow what they've done and do it yourself. And the last weakness, which is also a strength, is client-side rendering. This can be a problem in some situations with um, slower mobile devices. Rendering client-side takes more CPU and graphics power on the client. So that's what vector tiles are in general. But when we get to specifics, there's a few different formats. You can have GeoJSON. This is uh, this is, GeoJSON is a standardized um, format for geodata. It's uh, got good support and lots of tools. It's not the most sp space efficient, so people have used to uh, move to other options. Uh, TopoJSON is another standardized format, but it's more efficient. The client support isn't nearly as good. It's a uh, it. It does some th tricks to kind of reduce duplication with multiple geometries. Uh, the third big format is the Mapbox vector tile format, MVT. It is a binary format. This makes it a lot harder to work with and debug in many ways because you can't just open the file and look at it. It's but it's designed uh, for say for um, native apps and stuff like that stuff not, it can re, you can do it with javascript too but um, it's designed for that so it's quite efficient at that and then there are some other formats which are pretty specialized o5m which reproduces osm data exactly um, open science map binary which is an old which is an older binary format not used so much arcjuice services json which you would only use if you're a heavy as reshop. So all of the different ways to serve vector tiles kind of rely on basically the same architecture. You have a database, which is going to be a PostGIS database, generally loaded with OSM to PG SQL. And then you have it circled in red, some kind of server. And then it pr produces vector tiles, which you do stuff with, which could be turning them to raster or doing nothing at all, and then you send it out to a content distribution network, then to the client. So the, in general, these all work the same in that there's a generator, which is something that queries the database, comes up with a bunch of features for different layers, and writes them into a tile, which gets put into a tile store which is something like S3, Cassandra, something that stores objects. Could also be just files on disk, those work fine. You have a server, this receives the requests and 
if the tiles are in the tile store, it will fetch them from there. If they're not, it will uh, fetch them from the generator, which will then generate it. And depending on ex the exact architecture, this, this can work a few different ways, exactly which components it talks to. And then your other stuff is generally either doing nothing or turning it to a raster tile. So, what are some of the options that you've got for generating these vector tiles? I did a blog post on this outlining the options and they've got, the blog post has a bit more detail on some of these, but there's half a dozen major options which you could consider and some others that are more specialized. The first of these, which is, which is first because it's a bit different, is TileMaker which is uh, developed by Richard Fairhurst to develop Potlatch, Potlatch 2, and started ID. It takes a unique approach in that it reads in the entire OSM planet file at once and produces an entire set of vector tiles at once. This makes it very easy in some ways because you can then take this set of vector tiles and just serve them out as files with lots of reliable, easy ways which means you don't get calls at three in the morning that with a pager alert as operations. Uh, so this is because serving and generation are detached. But it's got some inherent problems with it that it, it's inherently unable to do incremental updates because it has to process the entire planet at once. And because it does the entire planet at once, it doesn't do very well on really big data sets. You'd be fine with, say, a US state even California, but if you put the entire planet through it, you will not have enough RAM. <clears throat> the most traditional option is Node Mapnik. Mapnik is a library originally written for generating raster maps. And, map, well, and what Mapbox did basically is vector tiles for them started out as a, taking how Mapnik represents things internally and writing them out to a file. It is, I would say, the most common option. It's the one that most people know. It's used, it's, it's a library, so it's not software itself, but it's used in, say, Cartotherian, which is what Wikimedia uses. It's used in Tessera, which is written by Seth, who is around somewhere today. And there's other options. It's got reasonable options for developing styles with it, like cosmetic. So, and that all comes from using Mapnik. When you're writing the rules to generate the tiles, you're writing them in um, the tile mill to source format. Um, I'm gonna speed up a bit, which is basically SQL and YAML. When I was evaluating this, it was looking at for uh, multiple contributor style. SQL and YAML is a reasonable format because you can have multiple people working and then combine the work and then you won't get horrible get diff conflicts and stuff like that. Big problem, the development of Mapnik is basically dead. Uh, there, wa there used to be a community of developers around it that went away a couple of years ago and Mapbox has moved away from using Mapnik in a key role. OnePlus says, though, that m most of the servers do have full support for incremental updates. Tilestash is another option. This is a fairly well-established tile server. It's been around for a number of years, but its vector tile support is, very, is quite new. It has one big problem. You have to write everything in JSON. Writing SQL in JSON is not an experience you want because you have to escape new lines. It's, we, with OpenStreetMap Cardo, we went, we went to a great effort to get away from this. You do not want to start doing this. Tegela is a new project. It's written in Go. The development is somewhat active. Um, Drawbacks, it doesn't have a tile store implemented. You have to do that yourself in front of it, which is actually really tricky. It also has a few features that are missing. I, 
as I believe they've mainly been added recently, but haven't made it into a release. The rules are SQL in TOML, which um, similar to YAML, you can actually have line breaks, you can have comments, you can have all of the stuff that you can't have in JSON. You have T-Rex, it's written in Rust. It's actively developed. It's mostly feature complete. It does have a tile store. It's got a nice demo front end for development so that you can see what you're doing. That's very useful because a vector tile isn't like a raster tile with an obvious visualization. It's a bunch of data instead. Rules are also SQL and TOML. Same advantages, it works. You've got MapSense TileMaker, which is one of the other big options. This is used by MapZen, obviously. It's used for their TileZen, which is their vector tile schema. It is currently um, SQL in uh, a template system. Um, it is changing, though, to uh, because of some of the peculiarities of what they're doing to avoid going to post just as often to introduce another abstraction which you do not need to use. That is all very new and being actively developed. ENDs from uh, MapZen is on the team that works on TileZen, and TileMaker and that, and he is at the conference t uh, today as well. The big drawback to it is it is a much more complicated architecture. It has a lot more moving components. It is a lot harder to get started with. On the other hand, it actually does everything that you need and has it's um, the only option here other than node map Nick, where people I'm aware of people using it for tiles for a base map in production at any kind of scale the the other ones are people are not just not using for those big projects yet and I'm just going to quickly go through the rendering options for time reasons You've got MapNet, TileZen, and or, no, that should be Tangram, not TileZen. Open layers, Leaflet, and Mapbox GL. MapNet is raster only, but it produces the best options, and it's got the languages that people are most familiar with. It's been around the longest. Tangram, got it right here, is written by MapZen. It's got JavaScript and C++ versions, and the styles you write them in Tangram scene files. Um, they're not the most common, it's unique to Tangram, of course, that format. Um, they're not hard to write. Uh, well, I didn't find them hard to write. You have open layers and uh, leaflet. These are in-browser only, so not a good option if you want to send your maps and have them rendered client-side on a phone. The performance, if you're for something really complicated, is really not known because people aren't doing that in them. It's good that people are doing, say, an overlay or something like that with few features, simple styles. However, one of these, I believe it's open layers, it now has supports for reading the same format styles as Mapbox GL, which is the next one. Mapbox GL is written by Mapbox, and it's like Tangram, it's got JavaScript and C++ versions for, both of these are written, it's either your phone or your mobile device. Um, styles are written in Mapbox GL JSON, which is a reasonably well-documented format, but it suffers from the problem of writing anything JSON. You can't write comments. It tends to be fairly verbose with a lot of escaping. But the style language is common to open layers, I believe. Um, so it, it, it has seen some standardization. Um, I've written in it as well. It's I don't like writing it. I'm perfectly cool. I'm good at writing it, but it wouldn't be my first choice for experimenting with stuff. And uh, lastly, I do have some more information in the blog post I mentioned earlier on. And for this, I implemented the same set of uh, rendering rules in multiple ones of these engines. Um, not all of them, because time reasons and some of them were complex. But, uh, so I have gone through the process of setting these up and finding things that I wanted to do and couldn't. So, um, being pointed out for time, so 
One or, two one or two questions will also be around at lunch. At the back. Okay, so Mapbox itself, uh, the, for generating vector tiles, they've got a proprietary option that is heavily tied in with Amazon. Basically, they read the stuff into, the updates into S3. They have a DynamoDB database with the current planet, and then they use uh, AWS Lambda tasks to, every time there's an update to, between it, that and the DynamoDB to write out new vector tiles, also to S3 and more, more AWS magic. Um, aside from the fact that it's proprietary closed source and you, I, it's a very complicated architecture, which if you are not heavily tied into Amazon would not be a good option for starting with. Can you do it to the mic so we've okay. got uh, so How do you think architecture of tile server will change with introduction of serverless services like AWS Lambda? Because right now you can have uh, rendering happening on Lambdas. Yeah, I don't see AWS Lambda being a popular option for this stuff. Um, architecturally, everything in, that I've seen involving that has been complex, a um, bit of a Rube Goldberg machine in some ways, and um, costlier and less efficient than more traditional ways of doing it. It, it, it adds, a, it's just a very complicated architecture that way. If there's no more questions, we're gonna break for lunch um, and meet back here at two o'clock. Thanks speakers and everyone for a great morning. Thank you, Paul.